You know, there's some things in life you've just got to do. Celebrate a friend's wedding. Going to Glastonbury. Or watching your mates measuring the distance from the house to the front door of Kibblesworth Workmen's Club with a trundle wheel just to prove who lives closest. But I've added another thing to that list. You see, ever since I was little, I've been obsessed with Bolivia's 10th best football team, Club Always Ready. You know me, Always Ready's biggest fan. I mean, even when I was a fat blonde baby stuffing me face with ice cream, my mum was always dressing us in Always Ready shirts, and that passion has never left. Which is why I'm lucky enough to be going to an Always Ready home game, my lifelong dream come true. Granted, the stadium is in the most dangerous part of La Paz, and yes, it finishes late at night with very poor transport links. And yes, people have told us that I should go with someone else for safety. But that's not going to stop us living my best life. To be honest, it'd be easier if I just blended in and looked like a local. Perhaps then I wouldn't get mugged. I mean, I've been told that I look like a lot of different people. That's has to price. But I've never been told that I look like a Bolivian. So in order to get to the stadium, it's an absolute mission. Totally different part of the city. I need to get three different cable cars. The yellow, the silver, and then the blue, and they just keep going up and up and up. If I thought La Paz was high in terms of altitude, this stadium is just like, ridiculously high, I'm struggling to breathe. Beautiful views though. Camera doesn't really do it justice, but the thing I'm worried about is getting back. It's gonna be dark. This stadium is in the middle of nowhere, like, it's, oh, this city's so sprawling. It looks like quite a big stadium to be honest, but it's just in the middle of like nowhere and it's quite intimidating. And what's more intimidating is the fact that I'm so far from like the campsite where I'm staying. So, I'm not going to talk into my phone too long because it's a bit dodgy around here, so I'm just going to get myself in the stadium. <laughs> So, I'm in. The stadium's about the size of Gateshead Stadium, I would say, but like tighter without the running track around it. I'm the only non-Bolivian person here, obviously. It's freezing cold, it's so high up in the mountains. There's two police officers taking photographs of themselves there. Can he turn it? And finally, I get to see me favorite team ever. Bigger than Newcastle. Good afternoon and welcome to Match of the Day. <laughs> so here's my match report. Entry to the game, which is in the Premier Division of Bolivian football, was one pound. Always ready started off well. They went 1-0 up after a penalty, which went in but was too casually executed in my opinion. Don't like that lazy style of run-up, just boot it. Shortly afterwards, Always Ready had a man sent off after some very controversial VAR checks. And inevitably, Oriente Petrolero equalised a few minutes later. I've stolen these highlights from YouTube by the way, don't tell Sky Sports. However, an absolute pearler saw Always Ready go 2-1 up before half-time. <laughs> Oh! 
Such was the controversy of the red card decision, the refs had to be escorted off at half time by riot police, perhaps a sign that maybe I should leave the stadium early to avoid any trouble. The always ready ultras were really rowdy, they even brought their own cheerleaders who must have been freezing their arses off the poor things. Also, I spoke too soon about being the only non-Bolivian. I got talking to a lad called Jan from the Czech Republic who'd also made the journey from La Paz. Clearly he didn't appreciate being photographed like. So we drank sweet coffee to warm ourselves up and chewed coca leaves to stave off the altitude sickness. Second half I bought myself an always ready hat for £2, absolute bargain, and watched as the away team got absolutely knackered around the 50 minute mark. Some of them clearly couldn't hack the altitude, and to be honest, I can't blame them. Always ready continued to push, but it was Oriente Petrolero who bagged an equaliser, and then in the last minute scored a winner against the 10 men of the home team. Me and Jan left the stadium quickly because we didn't want to get caught up in any bother, and we managed to make it back to La Paz unscathed. All in all, an entertaining game, Jeff and me dream of seeing me boyhood team come true. So I'm still at the campsite, working, cleaning, maintenance man, building fires, making breakfast for the guests, picking up dog sh I've been moved from my teepee, because some guests booked it out, into the blue house, which is a three bedroom house <laughs> on the campsite. Nice living room area. Kitchenette. Up the stairs. A couple of bedrooms. Lovely. It does mean it's warmer at night in here. I've been having... I'm probably going to keep banging on about this, but I've been having some proper issues with the altitude like I would say every other day I'm like just knackered by one o'clock in the afternoon can't breathe I'm struggling just walking around the house I'm struggling to breathe um just so draining and tiring and with the lack of oxygen your, your body seems to get more like niggles as well so, I'm glad I'm in the warm house. Now, that really helps. And it's easy to forget that like, this high up, three and a half thousand meters, or like nearly four and a half thousand meters for the, for the football match the other day, you're almost at the height that some airplanes fly. Like, <laughs> except you're not in the comfortable cabin, breathing manufactured air you're outside the cabin you're like up high in the air i'm teaching english this afternoon to some of the people from who work on the campsite because they want to improve that english which i can't really be bothered to do but feels a bit too much like normal work but uh it's nice to be able to impart me linguistic knowledge i suppose
I had a bit of a, a strange encounter with a, a Cholita this morning. Um, a Cholita is a, a woman um, who dresses in a certain way. And Cholitas are usually seen as an underclass of women. And this old woman who passed us, I was just about to video myself talking actually and she stood right in the frame of my camera. She must have been about 95 I think and she looked quite distressed and she kept pointing at her arm as if to say it was hurting but I couldn't say any injury and I just had to say look I'm sorry I <laughs> no English I don't I don't know what you're saying but it tied in with something conveniently that I wanted to talk about um so Cholitas are really interesting now most of the Cholitas I've seen are like over 40 years old I would say like you're born a Cholita and I've only seen one. I saw a girl in La Paz who was about 17, 18 years old and she was a Cholita because she was dressed that way. And she had like, like these massive wide hips and I thought them, that some of the hips are so wide that I thought they must like wear a frame under their dress, like a wooden frame or something. But apparently not. They just wear so many layers that it makes the hips look really wide. And in the heat of the day, like it does get freezing cold at night, and they do sit out on the streets and kind of sell clothes and sell food and stuff like that. But in the heat of the day, with that many layers on, they must be absolutely roasting. They've had a bit of a rough past, what with the patriarchy and misogyny and whatever. Um, but a few years ago, there was a group of uh, Cholitas who wanted to reclaim the word, much like queer has been reclaimed by the LGBT community and the N-word by um, certain groups in in black America. So these women got together and thought, how can we reclaim the word Cholita so that it becomes something positive? And they came up with the best idea ever, which you would never guess in a thousand years. That's right. Wrestling. Wait, time is passing quickly. I was at the camping site for a month. That's finished. I got on an overnight sleeper bus to this uh, <laughs> no good one horse town in the middle of nowhere, Uyuni. Still really high up altitude wise in the Andes, although it's flatter here. And the reason I've come here is because it's a base to visit the, the salt flats in Bolivia, which is a huge expanse of salt basically. It's supposed to be really beautiful. So I'm going to go on a tour tomorrow. And I don't know if you can hear it, but there's Queen playing in the background which makes a nice change from the constant Latin American music, which is nice, but when you can hear it all day, every day, it, oh, it gets a bit tiring like. Wait, this is the last full day of my Bolivian trip and it's been mucho belter. The day began with a visit to a dusty train graveyard, exploring the ancient locomotive carcasses rusting in the harsh Bolivian sun.
Next, I met up with a Spanish-speaking guide and a Bolivian family of five and was whisked away to the salt flats in a 4x4. This place used to be a giant prehistoric lake which eventually dried out to leave a vast salty crust. And what another worldly place it is. Upon first inspection it looks like clear ice, but take a closer deeks and you'll see that the salt has arranged itself into billions of hexagons stretching out over 10,000 square kilometres of the salt pan. During rainy season, which isn't now, the surface rainwater turns this place into the biggest natural mirror in the world and it allows space satellites to calibrate themselves. Anyway, along we sped, deeper into the brittle lake, exploring the alien landscape. We stopped for lunch in a building made of salt. Ironically, everything here is made of salt, although there was no salt on the table. Then we ventured back outside to brace ourselves against the bitter wind whipping across the plains. At some point later, you end up washed up on this bizarre island rising out of the salt, strewn with giant cacti. Give those bad boys a wide berth though, if you get caught by a needle, they go deep in the hurt like hell. I went for a hike to the top of the island and was able to look out over the blinding white vista, watching the jeeps come and go, creating lines in the salt like the strings of a giant guitar. Then it was time for the obligatory salt flat photos, which normally I'd scoff at in a cynical fashion, but actually it was a lot of fun. Look at how massive I am compared to that Bolivian family man. What an absolute freak! As evening fell and the temperature fell faster, there was time for a glass of vino rojo as we watched the sun fall behind the earth, painting the salt orange and purple and blue. Well, until next time...